Let's talk about being an ethical slut. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to today's podcast. My name is Brittany Simon. In today's podcast, we're going to discuss the book, The Ethical Slut. This is by Janet Hardy and Dozie Easton. And this book transformed my 20s. You guys know I talk about it all the time. I've recommended it to all my friends, and I will continue to recommend it to everyone I know. Now, before we jump in, I am drinking a tea from the High Priestess box that I got. Not this month. I'm not sponsored or anything. This is an older box. This is the Semhen tea chamomile, mugwort, and rosemary, and it's delicious. Very excited to get into today's episode. So I am going through a list of books that I have to read, about 30 or so, before I move to Europe because I don't want to take them with me. And The Ethical Slut was the first on the journey. We are having a discussion uh, on our Discord about it on the 2nd of February if you'd like to join us. It's through Patreon and it helps fund the channel. Okay, with that said, Already, rereading this book has brought me back to my 20s. You guys know I'm currently monogamous. I'm engaged. I'm getting married. We're very happy. We, him and I, sat down and talked to one another and said, hey, what do we want for this relationship? Do we want monogamy or open or swinger or poly? And it, even though him and I are, you know, we've all, we've spent the last few decades knowing ourselves and learning ourselves, it, when you're faced building a life with another person, you're faced with asking yourself those questions again, I feel, especially if you don't come from a religious bubble where the script is sort of given to you. We're both secularists. We're both atheists. So we get to curate the bubble that we want to live in. We get to decide exactly how we want our relationship. So we're big proponents of consent and the foundation of our relationship, the foundation of my personal philosophy in life is consent. And that is heavily, heavily um, encouraged throughout this book, which is why I still love it so much. So you might find a lot of Brittany in this book. Now, with that said, the first part I want to talk about, and I have all my notes within the pages of this book, is like chapter two, right? We just start off right away. The theme of this chapter is not needing to put someone else down to lift yourself up. So many of us in life, it happens. It's been, I've been there. You've been there. Sometimes I'm petty even now, girls, okay? But we don't have to shit on someone's yum, okay? We can still enjoy our lives while letting other people enjoy theirs. So, so many times we ick someone's yum. Have you guys ever heard that? It's like, you like, ooh, but that is someone's joy, right? So I get if it's personally to you, Mm -mm, you don't like it. I get it. But let's make sure that we're not demonizing people to lift ourselves up, right? Our happiness is just as important as other people's happiness. So if brother, farm brother, wants to be Catholic and modest and celibate until he's married, or if he wants to have a modest wife, or if he wants to be modest himself, or they want to live in a bubble where they don't have opposite sex friends because of temptation, that's all well and good, right? It's not being trapped. It's not being, um, you know, uh, dictated dictated by something other than their choice to be religious and therefore the religious um, kind of organization allows them to understand how to navigate life while they're on planet earth, right? And so with secularists myself, I don't have that script. I don't have a religion to sort of look at and say, oh, okay, tell me how to be. I don't believe in many things. I I know very little and I believe in very little, right? So right away in chapter two, Myths and Realities, it says, those who set down the path of exploring new kinds of relationships and new lifestyles often find themselves blocked by beliefs. Beliefs are so important. You have to have to acknowledge what is a belief and what is something you know, right? Both their own and the, uh, those of others about the way society should be and the way relationships should be and the way people should be. These beliefs are deeply rooted and far too often unexamined. I feel like what ends up happening is that we are born into bubbles, uh, cultural bubbles, um, backgrounds, families, economic status. We're born into a place and we don't choose where we're born. And then that place lets us know, hey, we've been doing things like this and we're going to raise you thinking you should continue these traditions. And then as the youth kind of grow old enough, they start to question and they want to rebel. And then maybe as they get older, they move back a little bit. Funny enough, I remember making a video in my 20s saying like, I will never be monogamous. Why would I ever be monogamous? In one point of your life, you're going to realize that you truly love and you're going to stop all that sharing sex and other weird stuff. By the way, nothing against it. It's just that you deserve the best. Hooray for love. And then a heart symbol. And I thought this was really um, interesting. I thought we would discuss it today. Um, you know, I've thought about it you know, a lot during my relationship, whether or not monogamy was something that would eventually work for us. And before we started dating, monogamy was taken off the table, right? He had two girlfriends at the time. I was looking for mine and I wasn't going to, um, I wasn't going to give up on the idea of finding Mrs. Wright. Now in the process of finding Mrs. Wright, I did love the idea of, of, um, having this big gorgeous poly family. And in that, 
idea or fantasy, I would obviously have multiple partners or they would have partners or, you know, there would be big cuddle piles, right? And sure, when I get comments saying like, one day you'll be monogamous, I think of scenarios in which that could be a possibility or for a very long time we could be monogamous. Um, but I, I don't want to be. <laughs> like, and so I don't think that I have to be. And now here I am in a monogamous relationship. But it's for no other reason than it just fits us so perfectly for where we are in our life now. Which I really like because later in the book, I don't exactly remember where, but she does bring up like monogamy and how monogamy can work for people. Because remember, being monogamous isn't just about like being, um, you know, toxically possessive of your partner and keeping them away from the world. Sometimes it's a matter of just being practical right? I'm sick. I don't have a lot of spoons. I can't, I can't offer someone truly a secondary relationship. Um, even if I didn't do hierarchical poly, I couldn't offer them time. I barely have time for my friends. You know how many new people have come into my life I want to be friends with and I just don't have the time. So the idea that I'd have time to date somebody else, just not, not probable for me. Also, I don't know how you guys view love, but I view like a lifelong commitment being on a team as being like directly involved in someone's life. So if my friends, I remember I knew a guy in Seattle who would say like, my friends are just as important as my partners. I do life with my friends. I ask my friends for advice. So I was like, but you don't do life with your friends. If push comes to shove, gun in your hand, you have to kill one or the other person. You're gonna like save the life of the person you care about the most, which is pretty much your primary partner, which is why polyamory is so difficult. And that's why people do it in so many different ways. You can do hierarchical or non-hierarchical. You can do a relationship anarchy or just being a slut. You can be single and fuck buddies. You can be lovers. There's so many ways to let someone know they're important to you, even casually so, right? I personally have only had sex with people, minus my assault, with people that I was friends with and that I cared for. I wasn't dating all those people, but I cared for them. They're good people, right? I don't have any people that I've slept with that I'm not happy with. I, I'm I'm happy with everyone that I've been with. I've been with about eight different people and different variations of sexual, uh, sexual exploration, but that doesn't count all the people that I've done kind of wild stuff with. Like, you're ever, have you ever been to like a BDSM dungeon and there's just like titties and you get to like walk, like motorboat all the different titties? I'm not really counting that as a sexual experience. I'm more counting that as like having fun with friends. But to somebody else and to somebody else's beliefs, that might be a sexual experience. But to me, it's just like motorboating titties. Like I would like, OK, like, I don't know. It doesn't feel very sexual to me, but it definitely is comfortable and lovely. Um, with that said, I think that going into your life, like as you move through your life, you get to pick and choose how you want to navigate it. So if you want to be slutty, you have to read this book. I'm telling you right now, it's so good. But also if you want to be monogamous, there are tons of books about that. It is really hard to be in a lifelong committed relationship with someone wh where you can't move outside of the relationship. My partner and I, as an example, navigate our monogamous relationship very specifically because I am a little bit more free spirited than him, um, but less free spirited than others. And I like to flirt. I like to look at people. I like to, you know, comment on people. He does as well. And we have a lot of fun doing that. It just comes out naturally. Like the way I talk to people, the way I talk to my friends, I'm just a very flirty person. And it's funny because my mom used to get that a lot when she was young and she would be slut shamed because she's very flirty. And then my mom just like shut it down because she's she's not a, she doesn't sleep around with a lot of people. She married my father and had 10 kids and did this whole thing with him. And um, my mom. I. As a child, saw the light go out in her eyes. Like I saw her wanting to be like kind of flirty and cheeky and tongue in cheek, but she didn't want people to call her names and she didn't want to be ostracized from her bubble. So she shut it down. I just left the religious bubble and decided to be in a safe space with a group of people that didn't mind and saw my my flirting as sort of fun and, 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 and non-threatening because like I don't want to be with you. I just want to flirt. Like I don't want to be with you. I just want to flirt. You know what I'm saying? Um, I also I think there's like a cleverness to flirting that I think is is quite a skill. And I kind of am impressed when people have the skill. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah, I kind of like to play around with my skill on occasion. So when you're moving through this book, when you're moving through life, remember, you get to decide how you want to live your, out your joy. But make sure it's really about you and not about like fuck you to the people who raised you and, and it's not out of anger or, um, you know, men suck so I'm going to be a feminist or women suck so I'm going to be a men's right activist. It's like, bros, you don't need to like push people down to lift yourself up unless we're being petty and in that case, go for it, booze. I'm with you on that. There's something about pettiness that feels really good and I'm just going to say humans are humans and we're all just going to human and that's just a part of it even when we're trying to be our best. Okay. 
Now, one of the things that I thought was pretty funny is that in one of the sections called uh, pathological, but in particular, it's judgments about sluts. Um, they were talking about the idea of slut shaming through the word easy. Like, oh, she's easy. And it's interesting because I I am. It's so weird. When I was in the my, my my sex positivity, like real sex positivity communities when I was really in it. Now I live in the forest when I was really involved with them. Uh, they would think I was a prude a little bit because I wouldn't sleep around with everybody. And I was very particular about who I do BDSM with. And I was very particular about everything. But if I hop over to the religious bubble, all of a sudden I'm a slut. And I'm easy. And it's so funny. Look, I think I'm a really easy person in general. I'm very clear with my boundaries. And I'm very good at negotiating. But I don't think I'm – well, I don't know. I don't think I'm difficult to sleep with because I don't have a lot of requirements. Do I find you attractive? Do we get along? are we both available to fuck, right? Like, I don't need a lot to have sex with a friend I like. And since I mostly am friends with the people that I sleep with, or at least friendly, I I don't see that as being difficult, but maybe I'm being difficult to some people while being easy to others. So in the book, there's this quote about being easy, and it says, is there, we wonder, the authors wonder, some virtue in being difficult? I think a lot of the time in more religious bubbles, the modesty of a person, how how long they hold out to give away their virginity, that's the game they're playing. So it's okay that in their bubble, that's the game they're playing. In my bubble, the game I'm playing is open, honest communication with clear intentions. I want to be deliberate with my communication. So I personally am very communicative with people I meet. Hey, I really like you. I'm attracted to you. Uh, do you want to have sex? Do we want to do anything? Do you need STI testing? What do we want to do? Right? I don't think it's offensive to ask your coworker if they want to have sex or even your boss. Like I'm pretty, pretty progressive, I guess, in that way, or maybe not progressive. I don't know. I don't know. I'm something. I just feel like adults can, I trust adults to adult, and then I accept that adults may be bad at adulting, right? So I don't think there is a virtue to either being super modest or super easy. I think it's more the kind of person you are. You've met those slutty girls, slutty boys who are very, they lie, they cheat, they deceive, they give you STIs, they're not considerate, they get pregnant on purpose. There are a lot of people who are easy who are very unethical. There are a lot of people who are modest, allegedly, or choose to be modest because they feel like I'm better than everyone else. I am superior to everyone else. I'm the good person. You're the bad person. It's like they have a neuroses of having like this loop of righteousness. I don't think these things are good. I don't think if you're sitting in your home thinking, I'm modest because everyone else is evil. Like, I'm not sure that's good for your skin, girl. And trust me, as a person who has a breakout right now, Stress is not good for you. It's not good for you, okay? So I think there are ways we stress ourselves out by being too critical of other people versus just saying, yeah, dude, I just like, I don't like the way you do things, but I appreciate that you, you're doing it. Go for it. You know, you, you do you, boo-boo. Like I really rely on the idea of you do you because I have tons of unique and wonderful people in my life that live lifestyles that I do not approve of technically, but only within my bubble. Do you guys see the difference? I, Brittany, hold a value system within the bubble I created, the way I want to raise my kids, da 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 and all my friends are going to raise their kids differently. My brother is going to raise his kids knowing that his aunt is queer, knowing that his uncle is queer, knowing that his other aunt is queer, but we, they, them, as Catholics, don't approve of homosexuality. They think it's a sin. They're not pro-trans. I still love my brother, and I still think he's going to raise his kids really good, and then, of course, they're going to know their auntie who's going to raise her kids very different. Like, I'm going to raise my kids progressive. I'm going to raise my kids with an understanding of the traditional a uh, background that I grew up in, but also an understanding of like, your mom thinks this way now. You can think how you want. I want my kids to be whoever they want to be. If my kids want to be freaking Republicans one day and little Ben Shapiro's, great, as long as they're joyful, right? But we're all going to live our different lives. But the way I'm going to do it is the way I'm doing it because I think it's the best according to what I think is valuable in life. So one of the things you guys know I hate more than anything is cheating. I think cheating is just like a bad um it's bad care. It shows bad character. I think it shows a lack of discipline and I think it's sloppy and messy and just painful. Right. But one of the chapters in this book, uh, this is myth number six, jealousy and inevitable and impossible to over overcome. Jealousy is inevitable. Oh, my God. Thank you. And impossible to overcome. The dyslexia is going to come out right now. Um, 
And then this is uh, talking about the myths of open relationships, like myths about sluts, myths, myths about can sluts be ethical? Can they like avoid cheating? Can they avoid hurting people? Yes. But you have to be thoughtful and ethical through the process. A lot of people I know justify cheating because they feel like, well, once the relationship is over, you're not cheating on anything. But it's not about what other people do when you have values. It's about what you do no matter how life gets hard, right? Now, I allowed a caveat for this. I call it survival mode. If you're in hardcore survival mode, like a Nazi has a gun to your head, bro, you're allowed to lie and say you're not Jewish. That's okay. You can do that, right? But in your everyday life where you don't have a gun to your head, do you really need to lie about your STI status, about whether or not you have birth control, whether or not you're in a relationship? Do you really have to cheat on your partner? Now, if you want to claim that you're in such an abusive relationship you had to cheat, there is a chapter for you in this book. And I think that's possible to be in a relationship where you want to open it up, but you don't want to lose the partner you have. But the issue is, if consent is the foundation of your philosophy, which it is for me, then you have to consider your desires, of course, but also the consent of the person that you claim to love. It's so selfish to think, well, I want an open relationship and I don't want to lose my partner. If you already committed to something different prior. Now, if you want to change the relationship, you need to sit your partner down and say, I'm so sorry, I've changed. And because I've changed, this relationship must change, right? But most people end up cheating, pushing their partner in a direction. There's a movie called The People We Hate at Weddings. I love it so much. It's so good. And there is a couple in the film, a gay couple. And one of the couple, um, Dominic, I think his name is, he's pushing, oh, what's the, Paul? So Dominic and Paul. So Dominic is pushing Paul into threesomes and opening the relationship. And and Paul's like, I'm sorry, am I not enough for you? Like, I don't want to open this relationship. Oh my gosh. And he even asks Dominic, do you want to open this relationship? And Dominic's like, no, no. But then he puts him in a compromising situation to have a threesome and it ends up breaking breaking up their relationship. Again, if you need something from the person you claim to love more than anyone, the person you've asked to be your partner, how can you not face them? How can you not say to them, I love you so much. Do you love me enough to see my needs? And because you believe in consent, do you love them enough to break up the relationship cohesively and or negotiate your intentions? Like with my relationship, I... We don't, we're just going to negotiate it. We're monogamous. We'd like to be monogamous. I think it makes more sense for our life. It makes sense for what we want out of life. We're very much, we understand this is our last life. And opening our marriage seems like very low on our need, on our wants list. It's not even a need. It's on our, maybe our want list, maybe in a faraway fantasy, but it's so low on that like it's so low like I much rather make sure we watch anime together every week that's like much more important to me but then again I've had tons of threesomes I've you know I've sledded around I've had my days so maybe for me it just seems like less important now mostly I'm focused on making sure that I have a long committed beautiful trustworthy open and transparent relationship with my husband one of the things that I think is so important is harm reduction Dr. Lindsay Doe talks about this a lot on YouTube she's amazing Harm reduction is very difficult to sort of parse out, right? In chapter three called Our Beliefs in the Book, here it is. It says, we are ethical people, ethical sluts. It is very important to us to treat people well and to do our best not to hurt anyone. This is interesting because what does it mean to hurt someone? Once again, my own existence can hurt my parents because they don't want their daughter on OnlyFans and they don't want her to be queer, right? I get it. I understand it. It took me many, 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 many years, I would argue 30 years, to really understand that it was okay to radically choose myself and still love my parents. I didn't need to put my parents down to lift my lifestyle up. I just needed to live my happy life and let everyone examine it for what it was, a place where I'm truly joyful, right? But that came out of a desire for me to think about consent in a very specific way. My my foundational belief is, is rooted in consent. And I try my hardest not to push my lifestyle down my parents' throat. And one day, maybe they'll stop pushing their lifestyle down mine. But I know why they do it, because we're all taught to do it. We are all taught to shame other people, to crucify other people. We're taught to hate other people who are different from us. We're taught to be afraid of people that are different from us. And I think sometimes that's reasonable. But other times, I think we're much more like each other than we believe. I think the world is mostly good. And I think the world is mostly doing its best, which I classify as good. I think the world is utilizing the tools they have and not everyone knows anything about their bodies their sexual freedom their liberation their like relationship to their bodies like being liberated from whatever culture they're born into not a lot of people have that 
This is why these books are important. So you can jump into this bubble and like try to figure out, oh, can I take a tool from this bubble and bring it into mine? I obviously have a lot of ex-religious or currently leaving religious people in my audience. And often the question is, when do I get to explore sexual freedom? Whenever you want, but at your own pace. There's no rush. I was a 22-year-old virgin before I had sex. I was 22. It was great. I chose the person I wanted to have sex with. Um, We only had sex for two weeks, which was what we negotiated. I wanted a very specific thing out of my first time. I wanted a safe environment with a person I trusted and a friend that I could laugh with when we made mistakes. I didn't want it to be like the love of my life. I had no um, preconceived notion, even when I was like a religious person, that I would like be with my husband the first time. I never really believed that the first person I would be with would be like a married spouse. I was always open to the idea of it being a friend. I really love my friends. Now, I don't have sex with all my friends. Again, I have to be attracted to you and we have to like actually want to have sex together, right? We have to be like friends, but we have to be like attracted to each other, okay? Mutually. Now, it goes on to say, our ethics come from our own sense of rightness and from the empathy and love we hold for those around us. It is not okay to hurt another person because we hurt too. And we don't feel good about ourselves. We don't want to we don't want to live in a world where people treat each other with callous disregard. So many people I know who I think engage in what they call is like righteous behavior are often hurting other people because I don't think they imagine it happening to them. Like if you have a fuck boy who goes around and like leads a girl on, I love you, baby, I'm going to be with you, baby, fucks her and leaves. If that happened to him enough times, it's going to fuck with you. You would think it wouldn't, but humans aren't that complicated as creatures, even though we're very complex. We just want to love and be loved. We want to be seen and and to see. We want to be understood, even if it's from something casual or something more intense. The amount of people that are saying they are unsatisfied with Tinder sex, what they are expressing is a frustration with not being seen during the casual. So I have sex with my friends because I want to be seen just enough so I'm humanized after and I can humanize them. If you're a stranger and I've never had a one night stand, I think it'd be really difficult for me to humanize that person because I just don't know who they are. I have no context to their character, right? So when you're moving through life, remember that when you read like the loneliness epidemic is happening, people are unsatisfied with casual sex. Nobody wants to feel objectified. Even if you're in a bad relationship, right? You have to decide what are your values and your morals. You can't hurt people just because you're hurt. But if you feel like you have the right to do that, please tell your partners beforehand so they know who they're marrying. Don't you think before you marry someone, you should tell them, hey, if this relationship starts to feel abusive to me, I'm going to cheat on you. I wouldn't sign up for that relationship. My partner and I negotiated everything before getting engaged. And we told each other the only reason we'd get a divorce is abuse. That's very important to us. And a part of abuse would be neglecting his um, desires, wants, and feelings and vice versa. But again, we're signing up for very specific relationship we created. There were no guidelines for our particular monogamous relationship. So we had to make up our own rules. And that's what something, oh, that's a quote in the book that's really good actually. Quote, we have no culturally approved scripts for open sexual lifestyles. We need to write our own. I don't even think we have a script for good monogamous relationships outside of religion. I don't think we have enough scripts for the uniqueness of our individuality. So you have to do it yourself. But it's very helpful to have a script to hold it against. So I can say, oh, my partner and I are monogamous in a secular way. So we are not sleeping with other people or doing sexual things with other people. But we can watch porn. We masturbate, we um, comment on how other people are hot, we flirt with other people. Um, You know, like I can name a few things that for other monogamous people, that wouldn't be monogamy. So even when I say I'm monogamous, that is something different than when my farm brother says he's monogamous. When When my religious family says they're monogamous, there is no OnlyFans. You're not flirting with anyone else. You're dressing modestly. You're not even offering anyone else the illusion that they could be with you. You know what I'm saying? So even monogamy doesn't have a clear quote unquote script anymore, but that's okay. We still have some idea of what monogamy means, but that's why I'm a negotiator. Why assume? Just ask, hey, what does monogamy mean to you? Why assume? We assume because of two reasons, I think. One, oh, we want the excuse of not actually inquiring for information that could stop us from getting what we want right? So if you inquire and you say, hey, um, I want to get married to this person, but if I tell them this thing, they might dump me, 
you are denying them their consent into the relationship, but you are going to do it because that's what people do. They're horrible. That is a mean thing to do to somebody, to lie to them in order to maintain the relationship. And then two, I think the reason that this ends up happening is just because, um, it, it, the other person hasn't created a safe enough environment for that person to talk. So what ends up happening is I think that when you're creating a script and you're negotiating, you are both afraid of the person be, and then you feel like you must lie, but also the other person should create an environment to make it safe for you to talk to them. So you're not going to get punished. But I also think rejection is the next step to our like progressive enlightenment. And I don't mean progressive like SJWs. I mean, just moving forward. As we progress, I think all of society needs to rewrite how they think of rejection. I think this is going to definitely be the like what I write about when I'm older. But rejection is about consent, right? So you lying to your partner so they don't break up with you, right, is not allowing them to have the right to reject you. And vice versa, you not creating an environment where your partner is allowed to reject you or you are allowed to reject them without anyone getting like incredibly massively like very upset about it. I think that's the issue we're facing. So as we read through this book and we, we, we're we figuring out what works for us, remember what works for you is you because you're you. I don't think there's a universal way for the whole planet to exist, but some people do. So be very careful of those people. When you're dating somebody, make sure you're dating the person you think you are. Don't make assumptions. But if you don't negotiate and you go with the flow too much, you might run into a lot of, oh, that's interesting. Now, I think... The difference between people who are deliberate and intentional with their dating, like I am, and then someone who's more free-spirited, let's see where it goes, is that we're looking for two different things. I'm looking for something that makes sense to fit into my life in the way that it's going. My life is very goal-focused. I know exactly what I'm doing in the next 10 to 15 years versus go with the flow free spirit people well maybe they're already so established in their life that now everything really is a mystery and they're allowed to add chaos into their life in that way i'm seeking stability at this stage in my life my partner and i are both interested in stability and peace we want peace for the rest of our lives we already know that if we have kids big if if we have kids that's going to bring in a chaos all out of its own but i have some friends that are totally free spirits they're into the chaos they're interested to see what happens that's great but again Make sure the people you're interacting with know that. Make sure the people you're talking to know what's going on. You know what I mean? I think some people make the assumption, of course my partner knows. But again, I always ask my partner, hey, did I remember that conversation correctly? Because sometimes I don't. We have so many conversations. We're talking all the time. I love him. We talk all the time, right? There's going to be things that get brought up that I don't quite process as like a permanent thought. So he's going to have to remind me, babe, we talked about this. This is what we decided. Oh, thanks, babe. Okay, cool. And then we can move on. It's not a bad thing to be reminded. It's not a bad thing to negotiate, right? It's also not a bad thing to be a free spirit. Just know what you're signing up for. That's all I'm trying to say, okay? Some people might think I'm too rigid in how I date, but for my partner, who's very anxiety like I am, it's really reassuring. There's a chapter in this book that says, uh, you don't need a reason. And then love and sex are the end, not the means. And then you are already whole. These are three different sections that encompass this, um, this sentence that I wrote down. It says, if everything was perfect, would you still have an issue with it? There is this idea in the book that gets explored of do you actually have a problem with open relationships or seeking out other partners or multiple partners or maybe just being a single slutty person? Um, or does your bubble tell you you should have a problem with it? Like, do you really have a problem with it? So when I meditated in my forest and I was going through and having my like big ego deaths, I asked myself, like, what does Brittany want? What do I want? Not what other people want. What do I want? If the whole world disappeared and I could create an ideal world, what would it look like? What would be open and honest and transparent? Consent would be the focus. Um, there would be, you know, like practice. We would have like STI Saturdays where we'd go get tested and we'd all, you know, have a focus on being healthy and loving and considerate. But human beings don't work that way and everyone gets to be who they want. And so that's just not going to happen. So when I think about my life and I think about what I'm actually OK with, I'm basically OK with most people doing most things. I think people do things for different reasons, but they can't do it to me. So this is very important. I don't care if you're a person on a journey where you belong in a bubble where like people are always cheating on each other, right? Because that's a real, that's a real kind of person, okay? Some people just be like that. 
I don't want it to happen to me and I don't want to interact with you in a romantic sexual way. I'm finding friends with people who want to operate in a world that I don't operate in, but that doesn't mean I like it or that I want to be a part of it, right? So again, it comes down to consent, right? But you ever notice that fuckboys always go after the people that never want to be fuckboyed? Do you ever notice that the thrill from a lot of these people are to go for the people who absolutely want nothing to do with them, which is where consent has to come in. The reason that fuckboy girls and fuckboy boys don't hang out together and don't go for each other all the time is because the thrill isn't as there, isn't there as much. Now, this isn't, I'm speaking generally, of course. I'm not talking for every fuckboy, fuckgirl. But you do you, right? If you use tactics to manipulate people to sleep with you, and that's your thing and that's your game, which I think is a lot of people's game, that's fine. I don't like it. But it's not my job to like your lifestyle. It's your job to like your lifestyle and leave me out of it, right? Just like the religious. I don't love it, but you seem happy in it, so good luck, right? For me, it would make me go crazy, but for you, it fulfills you and brings you joy. The other part of the quote is pleasure for pleasure's sake. Is there anything wrong with being pleasurable? Experiencing pleasure? Hedonism? Like, I am very afraid of hedonism as a concept because I'm a disciplined, stoic oriented human. But I understand the idea of seeking out organized pleasure. So I'm a very like consent based, negotiated based, thoughtful, non spontaneous, not spontaneous person who engages in behavior that even other people would think is wild and crazy, but I'm not even as wild and crazy as some of my friends. So that's what's even more insane is that I do believe you should seek out pleasure for pleasure's sake. And I think you should be consensual and warm and loving. But I also am not a hedonist. I think that discipline is important. I think being callous and only wanting pleasure can make you blind to the needs of other people. I think the other way to think about it is that pleasure isn't, um, or not pleasure, but like negotiation and consent isn't always pleasurable. So you might get annoyed or, oh, I can't believe we have to negotiate this. I, I can't believe we have to go get tested. I can't believe I have to ask you if you have birth control. Can't you just do it? It's like, yeah, but you're just checking in. Like my partner and I, we're very anxious people. We've met a lot of people that lie. We're used to a world that deceives. And look, if you're used to that bubble, maybe you figure everyone's lying. So asking someone would make no difference. But to my partner and I, since him and I try very hard as former liars in our lives, we try very hard not to lie now, right? Like we've all been like, I I don't know about you, but I was a queer kid in a conservative home. I'd light up the ass, okay? Like lying was a part of my life. Like if my dad was like, do you like girls? I'm like, oh, you know what I'm saying? Like that was just different, okay? I would tell my parents they taught all their kids to be great liars because they didn't create an environment that allowed their kids to be honest. Same in your relationships. If you don't create the environment to let your partner be honest. And at the same time, look, I was cheated on in a polyamorous relationship and I genuinely will die on my grave saying that I gave this man every opportunity to come to me with his desires And I never vetoed anyone he slept with except one person because I was getting really bad vibes from her. I was like, she seems dangerous. I gave him plenty of explanations. He still slept with her uh, without me knowing. And she ended up becoming like, she ended up being the stalker that I went to court over. She was trying to get to me through him. And again, I need someone in my life who trusts me so much. They would believe me if I gave them plenty of good reasons not to engage with this dangerous person. But you see how I didn't, it's not that I stopped him from engaging with a woman. He slept with tons of women before that. And I never minded. I used to come home from work and he'd be sleeping with one of our friends. I'm like, oh, hey guys, what's up? And they'd be like, hey, what's up? And we'd just be like, what's up? And then I'd go make coffee. I never minded. Jealousy is not something I experience. But if I tell you for the safety of me and our relationship, I'm afraid of this person. And then you engage anyways. You never were, you never trusted me the way you said. You were never my life partner. You were never my teammate. There is a difference between being um, jealous and malicious and no, you can't be with anyone. No one can even look at you. And then being somebody who's like, hey, I I trust you. Um, I'm going to give my opinion that this person might be dangerous and I don't think we should have sex with them. I think that is so important. But look, if you want to live your life and my ex-partner did and then him and I broke up and then we weren't together anymore, right? If he wants to go live his life and do that, that he can. Same thing. You guys can all live the lives you want, but please try to harm reduce. Please try to If you say you love these people in any way, you think you're a good person, consider those people's feelings. You don't have to. You can be who you want, but I heavily recommend it. Okay. Uh, Page 28. There's abundance is entirely available. There is uh, 
uh, uh, uh, like starvation economics. They talk about basically being affectionately starved, being physically starved. You're thinking about life and you're thinking about what I'm missing. So many of the incel communities, the men's right communities, they talk a lot about the struggle that men are facing, even though women can be incels too. And the word incel was created by a queer woman in the 90s. But okay. So men have co-opted that movement. I love that for you guys. And you've decided that you are without touch, without affection. And even though we're the most connected we've ever been, people are saying they're the least connected they've ever been. And that's because you're not being seen. You're not being considered, right? So I heavily recommend negotiation and thoughtfulness because it allows you to see very quickly if this person is going to see you, right? So if you're a go with the flow person, which is fine, you might end up dating someone for two years before you realize like, you don't like anime? What the hell? Right? That happens. I definitely have had many calls with many of my, many people I do calls with and they'll be like, I've been married for eight, 10, 15 years and they don't even know what religion their partner was born into. We forget to ask our people questions, but also sometimes we're afraid to because we're afraid of the answer. What if this perfect, perfect, perfect person I'm dating has one deal breaker? Am I going to ignore it or am I going to, you know what I'm saying? Sometimes like a uh, example, um, my partner and I have deal breakers in the relationship, but we went over those before we got together. Before we felt like really got involved in this relationship, I was like, hey, let's give each other every reason to break up, right? Let's ask each other every uncomfortable question to make sure. So the best one I always use is what if we have trans kids? Because that's a really easy way for me to move away everyone I'm never going to be compatible with. If you are not pro affirming your child's gender, we are not going to get along. Like as friends, yes. As lovers, eh, probably not. And as married, absolutely not, right? I need some sort of clear understanding that our values are going to be the same. And I would rather just boot this person out of my life no matter how perfect they seem because they're obviously not, right? So don't be afraid to ask questions, but also get ready to face rejection because dating should be about elimination. Dating should be about finding the right person and eliminating all the wrong ones. So we shouldn't be afraid of rejection. We should feel relieved we had rejection because, oh my gosh, thank goodness. Now I don't have to invest anymore in this person. I can go talk to the other 8 billion people. There are 8 billion people on this planet and 50% of them, let's say, are dateable. And even that, it's going to be less, right? Let's say there's a million people that are compatible with you. That's a lot of people, but you have to find them. So you're going to have to reject a lot of people unless you're very lucky and end up with your first person as your person, which is crazy, but great. And that happens. OK, uh, for trauma survivors, this is uh, page 55. No means yes. When we're talking about no means yes, right, we're talking about the confusion of language around these ideas of consent. No means no. Yes means yes. Yes means no. There's so much confusion in dating right now where there are bubbles where women play games and they go, no, I don't want to. And then your job as the man is to push the woman, right? There are women who want that. They want aggressive men to come into their lives and push them even when they don't want it. And I am not one of those women and I'm saying it right now, but I would say that first date because I would know the game. I would know the bubble. I'd be like, hey, don't do that. I know what you're doing and I that's not how I play. I want it straightforward. So what's up? Have when was the last time you got STI tested? What's your religion? Do you believe in God? Do you believe in trans kids? Like I would go straight first date. I don't care if it's exhausting. In my 30s, that is the only way I can date because I'm very serious about being partnered and I'm not interested in lovers and I'm not interested in um like dating for two years just to find out we're not compatible. Not interested, right? No way. Maybe especially because I'm a public figure too, is like I don't have that time and I also, I don't have that reputation time. I've had plenty of my relationships on the internet and they're ugly kids. They're ugly. And frankly, I don't want it again. You know what I'm saying? Okay, so, ooh, I love this one. Infinite Possibilities, chapter seven, page 60, asexuality and uh, celibacy, friends and sex, platonic relationships, AKA friendships. Relationships are all kinds. My friendships are relationships. My relationships with my family is a relationship. Relationships are great, diverse, and interesting. Now, when you form them, really choose them. Now, you know when they say like blood is thicker than water? 
I don't really believe that, but I do believe in chosen family. And so I kind of believe that the people I choose to be family are more important than anyone else. That's why I have an inner circle, and my inner circle is very important to me. I don't talk to some of the people in my inner circle, funny enough, just one of them, because he has to go on his own journey, right? He's like the one in my life. I love him, but like he is a mess, okay? So he's out there living his life. I'm out here living mine. But we always can contact each other. He can always contact me if he wants. Absolutely, absolutely, right? Because I love him. I have other people in my inner circle that see more of me and people who see less of me. I have people in my inner circle that might not even consider me their inner circle quite, but they do at the same time. Like they know, because we're siblings, we're always gonna be there for each other, right? Because we're siblings and we're connected by that. But we might not share like every dark secret with each other because for some of my religious siblings, it's really uncomfortable to hear about my life. But we still love each other and we're still there for each other anytime we really need each other. Then I have the four non-related people in my life, one of them being my future husband, who is my inner circle now. And I love them and they love me. And we maintain those friendships more aggressively because we are not connected by blood. We actually do have to make a very strong investment in our relationships. And we do, right? With my friends, I feel very closely related to them. I call my bestie my sister. I feel very close to my friends. I love them so much. But those are the four people that I brought into my life, right? My partner is my favorite person on this whole planet. I love him more than anyone. I want to talk to him all the time. But like the relationship I have with my bestie of 22 years, like she and I, we just watched the movie the other night, the one about the wedding. We watched it together. We did like a call. It was so fun. We caught up. We don't live in the same place. None of my friends live in the same place as me. But that relationship is so important to me. Of course, I want to invest in it. All my relationships are important. And yes, sometimes we'll have rough patches or ups and downs. But girl, have you never fought with a sibling? That shit can last years, but you always come back to each other because look, this is our one time on earth together. I want to honor our friendships. I want to honor our relationships. I love my friends. That's why I'm also okay sleeping with my friends. But I like people generally, but I obviously have favorites. And those favorites fulfill my life in so many ways. It's not just romantic. Yes, I'm the kind of monogamous person or the kind of relationship person that when I'm in a relationship, all I care about is my partner. That's true. I am that person, much like my siblings, much like my parents. But after work, after my partner, of course I want to hang out with my friends. Of course I want to do things with other people. Of course. But I've made a decision to live my life teamed up hip to hip with one person. So of course they have to get a majority of my time because they're taking up a majority of my brain power. I'm like, oh wow, I'm not just alone anymore. I'm with a person. Versus my friends and my family, they have the freedom to live any life they want separate from me. They don't have to ask me if something is okay. My farm brother doesn't call me before he makes a purchase, but my partner and I, we call each other before we make big purchases. Cause we're like, hey, how do we wanna spend our money? Hey, how do we wanna live our life? We're a team, right? I'm not in a team with my brother. But I am in a team with my brother. Let me explain. Okay, so there's the macro part of my relationship. So I'm a part of this like inner circle unit. Then all the inner circle units disperse into groups, much like a guild on fairy tale. You have the guild, like the fairy tale guild, which is a guild. And then you have the groups, right? You know, there's a reason why we all pair up separately. Like the brothers who lived with me here, the three brothers and me, we were the best unit to live together by far. Oops. We've all lived with different siblings at different times, but by far we were the best cohesive unit. And we were like kind of shocked by it, honestly, versus other people. They don't think about their lives that way. So they're always like, we should be friends with everyone or we should be as close as I am with my partner to my friends. I don't operate that way. I think we're all supposed to be close indifferently. I'm closer to my sister in certain ways and I'm closer to my friends in certain ways. I'm closer to my bestie in certain ways and I'm closer to my partner in most ways, right? How can we ask of the world sort of to recognize its uniqueness and then be upset that we then create unique relationships that do in some ways put people on a hierarchy? Because of course, I believe being seen as kind of the goal. Well, I've only met one person who can see me like in a really full and concise way. And that makes sense to who I am as a person. But if I was more, um, I think, poly-oriented, if I was more um, maybe open-oriented, I would maybe find more people that I feel that way about, but I just don't feel that way right now. But I'm not sure if it's the monogamy so much as meeting the person because he is the first person I've ever met in all of my life that has seen me this much. Most people see me about 60%, 70%, you know, so, you know, there's like 40%, 30%. Most people don't see me 99%, bros. 
that's fucking rare. And so I'm like, my person, I'll take you. And he's like, yeah, I'll take you. And then we decided to get married. Because again, I'm looking for a very specific requirement to marry me, not to be my friend. To be my friend, you don't have to see me a lot at all. You only have to see one part of me. I don't care if we are only friends because we go bowling. That's a great friendship to me. But if you want to marry me, if you want to spend your life with me, if you want me to confide in you 100%, if you want me to lean on you 100%, bitch, you better see me 100%. Okay, now, um, otherwise I'm good being alone. Like, people do not believe I'm I'm a great loner. People, I, I think I'm the best loner. Okay, now, as you're moving through this book, there is a section that I thought was quite interesting about being black and poly. This is going to sound really weird because this is such an American-centric book, but... In America, white people have had more privilege and time to involve themselves in subcultures outside of survival. BDSM is definitely a luxury. It's a privilege. This is expensive. Harnesses are expensive. Earrings are expensive. Decorations is expensive. Floggers are expensive. Uh, Going out, having time to sleep around is expensive. So uh, a lot of the, or at least in this section of the book, a lot of the black poly people who have had to come out and talk about it have mentioned that, you know, they haven't always had this time. And so it's different for them. And so they have their own like groups you can go to to talk about how to sort of move into this new way of being. You know, in the 1970s and 60s and 70s, everybody's like free love and hippie love. You know what I mean? Who are those kids? Who are those people? Right. It was all kinds of ethnicities, all kinds of backgrounds. But still, I think the majority of them are white. Right. I even now today, growing up in a Middle Eastern like immigrant household with my parents, There is a lot of, sometimes I see them, I'm like, oh, your immigrant is showing. Your immigrant is showing because we are not white. We might have white skin, but we are not white in that way, right? We're experiencing a completely different relationship with ourselves. Funny enough, um, the one in my life has this whole complex about um, the one, meaning the one on my level system one, if you're new to this. But he, um, the person I don't talk to often, he, um, he has a complex about just wanting to be white. Like, he's like, I, I wish we were born white. And I was like, yeah, it sucks, bro. But we're not. So. And like, that's what I'm trying to say. When people come to me and go, Brittany, you are white. Yes, I am Caucasian. But in America, I ain't white like other people are white. It's very important to recognize the difference. But you won't see it unless you're in a bubble, right? Or, or you're in my bubble. It's just like with sex. In my sex circles, I'm a prude because I've only slept with eight people while all my friends have definitely hit like 50 plus, three digits. And then in my religious circles, I'm a slut because I hit over one partner. Everyone is going to view you differently. Make sure you know who you are because while the world is telling you who you are, you might feel a little gaslit. But come on, you know who you are, people. Okay, page 70, praise for monogamy. They have a little section here, which I appreciate, which I I swear might be new, but maybe it's not. But it's a, it's a a uh, it gives plenty of, Good reasons for monogamy. Example, a way to focus your energy just on one partner instead of spreading it over several. True. Because I don't know about you, but I'm low on spoons. So I can't. I can't. God, I would feel so guilty if I asked someone to be in a lifelong commitment with me and I didn't offer them 100% of my energy or attention. Like, it's not that I offer my partner literally 100%, but you know what I mean. I offer him so much thought, so much consideration, so much team-focused energy. Um, thoughts. Like I'm thinking about him. I'm thinking about us. I'm thinking about our money. I'm the breadwinner. I'm thinking about how to take care of our family. I'm thinking about all these things constantly. When you have a partner, I want to give that to them too. And I just can't give that to many people. I can, okay. I can barely keep myself above water. Thank you. Uh, A way to keep the decks cleared for other major responsibilities, a new baby, graduate school, a demanding career. My partner and I decided to be monogamous mostly because of time. We have no issue ethically with non-monogamy. We think it's great. But time-wise, him and I don't have a lot of it. By the time I'm done with work, by the time I'm done even just like getting my chores done for the day, if I even get around to it, I'm so sick and so tired that I don't have time for other people. Right now, my friends are all taking a back burner. My friends have to take like step away from me. I am so focused on just working and making sure that I get my work done. And then maybe if I have extra time, I'll see my friends. Hanging out with my partner doesn't count. It's like hanging out with myself. So even when I'm with him and we're watching anime, that's my way of diffusing my stress. Um, But I can't do that with friends. When I'm with friends and I'm and I'm like, I don't know how to say this. Even when I'm with my family, even when we're with each other, we're like, hey, too much, too much of this energy. Even my own sister and I, we love each other so much, but hanging out with each other does not feel like relaxing all the time. With my partner, 
It almost always feels that way because, again, I don't have to explain myself. He understands me. And and even if I have to explain myself, it's barely. So let's say I'm with my religious brother and he says, well, why? Why do you think this way? I don't understand. This is one of the it's it's not this is not relaxing for me. I just want to be with somebody when I'm stressed who is not going to start a debate with me. Right. And even if he does and he realizes like, oh, babe, I'm so sorry. Are you out of spoons? I'm like, yeah, bro. Like, I'm totally out of spoons. <laughs> He's like, I'm sorry. Like he you know what I mean? He's so apologetic. He, we ask each other, hey, do you have the spoons to have a conversation? Hey, do what do you want to talk about? I just want to make sure before I go into it. Hey, should I save this thought for later? We are constantly negotiating with each other, constantly checking in with each other. We don't want to assume that the other person isn't tired, right? So again, monogamy for us is not because we're anti-open. It's just like we're tired and I don't have the time, okay? I don't have the time. Tools for successful sluttery, page 85. So interesting, this one, because I wrote down the notes, the basics, getting the basics, you know, communication, emotional honesty, um, affection, faithfulness, limit setting. I wrote down um, your do's and don'ts are not a punishment to your partner. So many times in relationships, I think, and they cover this perfectly, that we think we're being punished when our partners give us boundaries. Even our friends can feel punished when we put down boundaries. But if we believe in consent and we believe in that, per like we want to think about that person, then we have to think about that person. And so we have to be open to the idea that they're not putting down boundaries because they hate us. They're putting down boundaries because they love themselves. And we need to respect those boundaries. So even in open relationships, there are boundaries, which takes us to chapter 10, boundaries. Okay, in chapter 10, what are boundaries? Owning your choices. Boundaries are not traps. They're not cages, unless you think of a cage as a good thing, which I've been put in a lot of cages. I like them indeed. But I like to think of boundaries as a safety zone. The best version of Brittany is one with boundaries. When I didn't have boundaries and when I don't have boundaries with my friends and family, I become a bad person. And it's because I become stressed and overwhelmed and I don't know what to do. And then I get frustrated and want to isolate. So by creating boundaries, including time I isolate away, I am offering my friends and family a better version of myself when I come out of my cocoon. Like right now, I'm very open about the fact that I'm stressed. I'm very open about the fact that I'm sick. My birth control is literally killing me. It's not working with my lupus. I have to take it out. It's a big pain. It cost me $1,200. I'm very stressed. I am okay with this. This is life. Life is hard. For my ancestors, it was a lot harder. I, I know I can handle this. I just need time to handle it. So when I put down boundaries, I'm not punishing people. I'm saying I need this for my health and happiness, right? So when I put down my relationship boundaries and I say, babe, I love you, but I don't want you to um, talk to other people about our relationship troubles unless you come to me first. It's something I learned in my past relationships. In my past relationships, I would talk mad shit about my partners to the internet, to my friends, to everybody, and it made it so much harder for them and I to solve our relationship problems. Nobody needs to be in your business. So when I put down boundaries now, which is very different, I already told all my friends and family, I'm not going to talk about my relationship with you. I'll talk about the good things. And maybe I'll talk about some of the basically like, okay, trouble issues that aren't that big of a deal. But anything that's personal to him, anything that's personal to me, we want to come to each other first. And then if we can't solve it, we'll go to trusted people. Even your friends have a tendency, no matter who they are, because humans are going to human, we tend to remember the bad things the most over the good things. So if you tell your friends too many bad things about your partner, it's going to be really hard for them to remember that your partner is a good person because all they remember is the bad. All they remember is you being sad. All they remember is you complaining. And so it's going to be a lot harder for them to be open. My family even said, wow, you've been dating this guy for like six plus months and I haven't heard you complain once. I'm like, I know. There's nothing really to complain about, to be honest with you. Um, but it could come up. And when it comes up, hopefully him and I will tackle it together, right? One of my favorite couples that I know, they've been married over 42 years. They're amazing. They're very private. And I like that. I like that a lot. They're very private. I know they have problems. I'm sure 42 years of marriage, there's going to be a problem. But they handle it on their own and they go about their day. They don't make their problems other people's problems. That's the thing. Don't make your problems my problems. Some people like it. Some friends like to be therapists. I like to be a therapist sometimes. But honestly, as I get more and more into my relationship and we possibly will have kids, yeah, I'm going to have less time for people, especially if my career takes off. That's the irony. That my success in life will make it harder on the people around me because they'll get less of me, right? But that's just life. We all get less of each other as we move on. And that's why we have vacations. 
That's why summertime at Brittany's house is going to be a party. That's when I want to see all my friends. Come visit me in the summer, kids. Okay, now. Chapter 11, The Unethical Slut. I really appreciate that they put this in the book. They put this in the book because, yes, there is a way to be an unethical slut. I believe my ex-partner, who cheated on me in my polyamorous relationship with him when he didn't have to, was unethical in his poly, unethical in his open. Because, again, we had negotiated. We had an understanding. If I had done what... If I had done what he did to me, he would have most certainly crucified me for it. But I wasn't the one who did it. He did it. And he wanted sympathy and understanding. And he was like, I just didn't understand. Like, I didn't understand how bad she was. And then this woman went for him, girls. Like, this woman went for his reputation, went for who he was, tried to, like, get him in, um, on a rape charge that was proven false. Like, a whole mess. And I looked at him and I said, this is why I can't trust you to be my husband. This is why we can't get married. Because you trusted some girl that we just met over the person you've been dating for many years. That's not a good sign of commitment, guys. I want a committed relationship. I want open, honest, transparent. Now, I mentioned this in the last pat- last podcast. Remember what you're signaling. If you say you want an open and honest, transparent relationship, but then you lie, cheat, or don't want to know things about your partner, ask yourself or be honest with yourself that you want open and honest and transparent to an extent. Like flagrant, Andrew Schulz says he doesn't want to know his girl's body count. Fair. But now you have to be open with yourself and say, Okay, you don't want to know her body count. Strange. This is the person you love more than anyone, the person you might have kids with, the person you want to open yourself up to, but you don't want to know everything about them. For me, that's fine. You can do that. Absolutely. That would be crazy to me. My partner and I, we would just think that was like that would not work for our relationship because the coolest part, the only the only perk to being partnered is that you actually get to be yourself with somebody for me. Like the only reason I would ever get married is if I could be myself with somebody 100% without them hating me or holding it against me or picking a fight with me. And that's what I'm trying to say is that it's not bad that those things happen because you weren't meant to be with those people. But I think the sign of being that that's your person is that you can be that thing. Now, that's just for me. Again, just for Brittany, just for Brittany. So I couldn't even imagine it. Like I wouldn't even get married. I would never date someone long term unless I could 100% be with them like myself 100% of the time. Okay, now, chapter 12, flirting and cruising. The fine art of flirting. I love flirting. I just love it so much. I think there takes a certain level of intelligence to flirt correctly and and appropriately. And then at sometimes, girls, I have been so bad at it. Oh my God. I'll t- you want to know the cringiest? Oh my God, this is so cringy. Oh, do I want to tell you this story? It's so bad. Okay, we've all been there. We've all flirted badly. There was this really hot guy I worked with at a grocery store once. He was so hot. And he liked me and I liked him, but I, I could tell that I wasn't his type. And I get it. I'm I'm very few people's type. I get it. But we were at we were drunk at a bowling alley, and I'm not good on liquor. Don't, I'm not good on booze. I'm a weed girl. So I was, I'm there. Oh, this is so silly. And there was a girl there that he had slept with. And I was bisexual. And a lot of the guys would come to me to talk to me about girls and like having sex with girls. So I was like trying to be a guy. (laughs) This is so cringe. I was trying to be a guy. And he I'm talking to this cute guy. And I'm like, so uh, what was fucking her like? And he's like, whoa. And I was like, I'm my bad. I said that really weird. What was it? Um, ooh, and I didn't know what to say because like I was trying to start the conversation of talking about sex and then we were talking about girls. So I was like, what's it like fucking that girl? And then but the way I said it was so crude that I think it was too much for Orange County level socialization. OK, so I fucked up and it like sizzled out the potential anything ever. Not that we were going to do anything, but it definitely sizzled it out like it was done. And I was like, fuck, OK, no problem. Next person. And then I was like, OK, next person. I loved it. that section of my 20s was the best. Uh, not really, but it was it was awesome. That was when I found my first guy to sleep with, my first girl, my first girlfriend, my first like a lot of first happened in those years. And we were just figuring it out. We were sloppy and messy. And I negotiated. I was already in BDSM at the time. So I was already good at negotiating and consent and all that stuff. But I was really trying to bubble hop as well. And I was trying to say, okay, I'm in their bubble. They talk this way. How do I also talk this way? But I I missed the mark. So don't freak out if you miss the mark when it comes to the art of flirting. But flirting is an art. Did you see the other day how I flirted with Abba and he got a little like, I told him he'd be a good father because he had mentioned it before. And then I brought it up again because it was like tongue in cheek, but also a little clever. Damn. But he got a little flustered. I don't know. I encounter this kind of stuff on a regular basis. I just, yeah. I'm not part of the world. So I don't learn the lingo, nor do yeah. I really care about it. 
I will say this, like, you would make a really good father. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> You're being stupid right now. <laughs> I'm being stupid. I am. I am. Well, you know what? If it wasn't in the context of this conversation, this wouldn't be wild. But in this conversation, this is a wild thing to say. I'm just saying. Obviously, I'm getting married. Obviously, and it's not to Abba. But I'm just saying. Like there is there. You're right. Like that is like that is nice to hear, right? <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, all right. <laughs> Hey, listen, listen, we're, we're going to move past that one. That was, that was, that was okay. wild. That was I wild. know. Was I'm wild. a wild girl. That's why we're friends, right? There's something to flirting. That's like, it's nice. And it's great because like he knows I'm getting married. He's very supportive of my relationship. I'm, I'm his friend. Um, We have a very good relationship, very platonic, but flirting is safe because he knows I'm getting married and he knows I'm not a cheater. So I'm not actually flirting with him. And all of this stuff is why it becomes safe and then becomes like an art. So the art isn't always to get laid. Sometimes it's just to fluster your friends. This section was funny. It was about dating for different categories of people and flirting. So like for women, for men, for trans and non-binary people, everyone wants to be flirted with differently. And even though you can say women want to be treated differently than men and non-binary people different, also within those groups, people are going to be wanting to read it differently. So one of the sections here talks about how women want to know you can handle a no. Often in not my circles, but the circles I grew up in, they women would do that. No, no, I don't want to. And then they'd switch it up and be like, actually, I think I want to. Because once a guy can handle a no, the women becomes they, they feel safe. I don't think men understand that when you push a woman enough, they're going to start feeling just unsafe to say no or yes, or maybe, or I don't know, like there, if there's not a safety to explore. One guy, um, I, he was my, he was great. He was my last attempt at questioning myself in terms of dating. Before I started doing my rapid dating of one date and we're done, I dated this guy who was really, really great. He was like eight years younger though, super young and really sweet and really awesome. Oh, was he even younger? No, at the time he was eight years younger than me. And we watched anime. And at first I was like, we're not going to date, dude. You're too young. I know it. And he's like, oh, damn. But then we started talking as friends. And then I was like, well, fuck, I like talking to you so much. Do you think, but I think the age thing is going to be an issue. And he's like, no, no, no. So we tried it. And I know in his head, he's probably like, man, girls always do this. But the truth is, is that I want there to be a safe environment for us to really explore and then for us to let go. But that's who, who I am. So he took it well. We don't talk anymore, obviously. But I think he's doing well. And I really liked the so many months we spent time together. We played Smash and watch anime and hang out and talk about stuff. Um, but yeah, it was like clear we weren't compatible um, for a lot of like found, funda foundational reasons. But I needed to kind of date him to figure it out. So that's another thing, too. I, I love these people who get married once and they're good. I was not, I'm not this person. I need to explore. I need to experiment. I need to talk to people. I need to question. I need to do a lot to figure it out. So by the time I was done with that relationship and I was into this new dating style of farm brother dating, I knew how to have one date and that was it. Because you just need to ask a certain amount of questions to see what people believe. Now, this is important. It's not, I'm not saying I only need one date to know if I'm going to marry someone. I need one date to know if this is a person that I could marry, but might choose not to. So one of the things my partner and I said to each other is, even though we're in love, do we still want to get married? Because I do not believe being in love means you have to get married. I think you can be in love with a lot of people you never marry. Because again, you want to be in love, va va voom, sexual chemistry, and the resume chemistry. You want to have both if you want a long-term relationship, at least in my model, in my world. Okay, now, okay, there's a whole chapter in STI and risky behavior that I really appreciate. In particular, the word fluid bonding is something I want to point out to you guys as one of the greatest wor like words I learned or saying I learned. Fluid bonding, pretty self-explanatory, but let me go on. Fluid bonding, anything that involves fluids, kissing, spitting, vaginal, anal, anything that involves the possibility of transmitting STIs or bringing you closer in a much more intimate way. My sister and I have never had to fluid bond because I don't make out with my sisters, right? Well, sister, I only have one, right? But some of my friends and I are fluid bonded. I have made out with plenty of my friends. So not everybody is going to have the same reaction to the concept of fluid bonding, but I found it very helpful of, oh, levels of intimacy. So even in my relationship, we're monogamous, but we can flirt, but we can't fluid bond. We can't kiss other people. We can't spit 
you know, in like sexual ways with other people. I can't spit in someone's mouth and they can't spit in mine. You know what I'm saying? We can't do anything anal or vaginal, anything that's intimate in that way. No go. In BDSM, a lot of people were my play partners and we were never fluid bonded. So many of my BDSM partners, I've never touched their genitalia. They've never touched mine. I've never kissed them. All of that. So even though we're intimate and it's very personal and according to most bubbles, they'd be like, oh, that's sex. Sex never happened and nothing sexual ever occurred. But we, we, but again, I have language in my, um, uh, in my tool, toolbox that other people don't have because of books like The Ethical Slut. I know what fluid bonding is and I know the concept around it, which makes negotiating much easier for me. In the, the same chapter about STI testing and prevention and everything, I wrote down a note that said, what are you willing to do uh, on sex and drugs? I think a lot of people forget that you know, when you're involving yourself in these high intimate moments, these high chemistry moments, you have to remember that you're also, you have other layers. So there's the layer of attraction that kind of distracts you, the layer of intoxication that distracts you, the layer of intimacy that can distract you. So make sure when you're interacting with people, you're being very aware of your own limitations. Because remember, it is your job to know yourself so you can communicate it to other people. Uh, page 126, this is on child rearing. Uh, they're talking about basically ways to exist on the planet, different bubbles. They're basically explaining different bubbles. And I wrote down a note that said, no matter how, which, how slash which bubble you raise your kids in, they'll be weird to somebody. You will be weird to somebody, no matter who you are in the world. That idea of like, that's not normal. You're not normal. To who, bitch? Normal just means common, okay? Everyone is weird to somebody else. Everyone is different to somebody else because we're diverse and there's 8 billion people on this planet. So remember, when you're navigating your relationships, when you're deciding how involved should I be in my partner's children's lives, talk about it. Uh, part three, navigating challenges. I wrote down jealousy. Jealousy is such a weird idea to me. Um, so in my relationship, I try to practice no lying. Um, I try to practice boundaries. So if my partner asks me something that I'm not ready to confront, I might ask for some time. And obviously he would give it to me because we don't want to like, you know, mentally abuse our partners here. But we also want to be a safe space to say things out loud and then confront them with one another. Jealousy is something that's hard for me. I don't think I experience it from everyone's um explanation of it. I don't think I do. And some of my partners have had problems with that where they're like, I want you to be more jealous. I get it. I can be plenty possessive though. Like I'm very possessive. That is mine. That is my person. Do not touch my person. That is mine. But I'm not really jealous. It just comes from a place of, of like, yes, mine. I'm so happy. Mine. Like my cat is mine. When I dated other boys and girls and we had breakups, Indiana Jones was never anyone else's cat. That is my cat. But am I jealous of other people getting along with my cat? No. Like it's a, but she's mine. So at the end of the day, she's going to come home to me. She's going to want to be with me. She's not going to want to be with you. So that's all that matters to me, which is probably why I don't really have jealousy. And even after my last partner cheated on me, I was never jealous of that girl. I was scared she would hurt our family. And she did. I was right. So ultimately, I don't know that I have a really strong experience with jealousy, but I, I think it is normal to have be jealous. I think it's common. And I think that people, uh, it's okay to feel it. And I think there's a way to move around it. Does that make sense? Like, I'm not trying to, I'm saying I'm the abnormal one. I'm pretty sure. And I'm, and I can see that why that would be hard for someone to date. You know what I mean? Because maybe they'd wonder in some bubbles, like, if you're not jealous enough, do you really love me? I think that's one way to think of relationships. It's not one I approve of. It's not one the book approves of, but it could be one that works for you. So you do you. But for me, uh, wanting jealousy in a relationship is probably unhealthy. Okay, naive love. There's so many times in life we love naively and we have like innocent love. And I think that's valuable. And I think that's sort of what coincides with jealousy a lot where we have this idea of, um, uh, how do I say this? Like having a cognitive dissonance with sort of what we actually want. Again, what are you signaling? If you say you want an open and honest relationship, but you say hide yourself in this way from me because it will hurt me. You know what I'm saying? That's very confusing. OK, so I think it's it's partially because of the naivety of facing and, and feeling like you'll be safe after you've you've told someone something. You know what I mean? All right. On page 161, win win solutions. I'm a big proponent of win win solutions. And this is what I mean, because I think a lot of people have different ideas of what a win win solution is on Fresh and Fit. They would say a win win solution is a girl that lets you have an open one one side opened relationship. So like 
Myron would date somebody, marry someone. He would wife someone up and he would have other girls, but she wouldn't have other people. And the only way that's a win-win is if the girl genuinely wants this relationship. If the girl is like, fine, I guess I'll settle. You do pay me. You give me money. That's not a win-win solution, okay? That is a win I guess solution like where she's like I guess I'll do this if you're not doing it with enthusiasm like this is the life I want to live I have one life on the planet and this is the one I want then how is this a win-win solution right now I have met open poly monogamous people that have these one-sided relationships but this is how it goes I'll meet a woman as an example and she is open and she is a dominatrix this is a real person I met and she is a sex worker and then her husband is monogamous he has no interest in other people he literally doesn't care. He doesn't, she, he loves her job, but he's not motivated in any way by caring if she's with other people. He just wants to be with her. He's pretty happy. This happens. This is reasonable. He's choosing this. It's just who he is. Some people don't care. Even when I was poly, I would sleep with other people, sure. But often people would mock me and say like, oh, are you monogamous? Because you're so focused on your partner. I become very focused on my partners. I, I just... I don't know, like I'm always open to sleeping with people if it's convenient, but if it's inconvenient, I'm not the kind of person to go look for it. Like that sounds like a lot of work. You know what I'm saying? I'm pretty, I'm a pretty content person. So I look for win-win solutions, making sure everyone is getting exactly what they want or we shouldn't be, I'm not interested in that relationship. Like again, you can do you, but I am not interested in any romantic long-term relationship in which I don't get exactly what I want. 17, making agreements. And obviously I'm very obnoxious because I feel like I got everything I wanted. Um, So again, like I'm not, and it's not, it's not like, uh, maybe my standards are different. When I say I got everything I wanted, I mean, I got everything I wanted that was important to me in a relationship and everything that I don't particularly like, um, that's okay because I don't, I don't, I'm not perfect and they're not perfect, but like, it's not, it's not a deal breaker. It's like, oh, he leaves socks on the floor. Like that's not a deal breaker for me, but for some people it would be right. So again, whatever your deal breakers are, you have to seek out. So my partner has none of my deal breakers. That's why we're getting married. If he had any of the deal breakers, we would be out. Okay. So chapter 17, making agreements, negotiation, deliberate versus spontaneous. I asked my voice chat on Discord about this because I said, what's the opposite from a free spirit, person who's a free spirit when they date? And someone said deliberate. Like, what's the opposite of spontaneous, deliberate, thoughtful, intentional, which could sound insulting to the free spirited people, but I don't want that. I want to be very, very conscientious. So I took down these notes too. Hold on. I have all these notes. I wrote free spirit open versus calculated and intentional. I'm a very calculated, intentional person in my life now. I used to be more uh, open-spirited and open-minded, but not so much. I'm very open to everyone living their life how they want, but I am not open-minded to how those people interact with me. So I need you all to hear me. I am open to you living your life over there. If you want my approval, you're not gonna get it. If you want me to say, um, uh, oh, I want Brittany to like fight for my type of relationship. Why? You do you. Okay. But also I think most relationships are perfectly fine. I think if you're a hardcore religious person and you date super modestly and you don't let your girl on OnlyFans, I think that's fine. I don't care. Would I do that in my relationship? No, but that's not my relationship. It's yours. So I don't care. I would actually encourage it for people in that bubble. So if I got a religious caller who's like, Hey, I'm a devout Christian, I'm a devout Catholic, I'm a devout Muslim. How do I go about doing this? Well, I'd research their religion and then help them find their joy in that religion. It is not my joy to pull you out of your lifestyles. I don't want to do that. I think you should find peace and joy in the life you're living and the life you want. So um, in this chapter about negotiation, I like making agreements with my partners. I like saying, yes, we're both deciding to do this because I want to know what we're doing tomorrow. Every day, basically, my partner and I check in with each other and ask, how's your schedule looking today? I don't want to bother you during work. I don't want to interrupt your flow. I want to make sure that I'm a positive influence on you. Do you have time for me today? My partner does ask me if I have time for him. And I, of course, if I have any free time, I give him priority. And then after we're done, I give other people priority. But work has to come first. And he knows this, one, because I'm the breadwinner. And two, because he knows my job is very important to me. And three, he knows I'm sick. So I'm not going to have all the energy in the world to do this and that and this and that. So yes, my partner, even though he is the greatest thing that has ever happened to me, he's my favorite person on this whole, whole planet, 
Even he kind of comes second to my job. I mean, kind of, sort of, yeah. Because we kind of, you know, I need money, okay? Like, I need to feed myself. I need to pay for groceries. I have to go to Walmart after this with my brother Mark. So, of course, he, he, he even asks me, hey, babe, do you have time for me today? What does your day look like? Now, the only day of the week that I am 100% obligated to see him is Sundays. So Sundays are our date days. And Sundays are the only day of the week that my partner should have an expectation of talking to me. But of course, if we could, we talk every day. But I have a job and he's nine hours ahead of me. So our schedules are completely off. So we just message each other a thousand times a day on Discord. That's what we do, okay? Apps are where it's at, okay? So we won't be able to talk to each other. Maybe we won't be able to Zoom. Who cares? We can just text each other. It's great. I'm really grateful to have him. And I know that it's inconvenient right now. But it's okay. So even he and I have to negotiate when he can see me, what I have available for him. And even when we get together, I'll be like, okay, babe, I have 45 minutes. Or babe, I have five minutes. Okay, I have two minutes. Like, and we'll talk. I love you. Bye. And that's it. And it's great. And it's wonderful. And I love it. I had one guy I went on a date with. I called him. I was like, hey, you have 10 minutes? And he's like, why are you putting a time limit on it? I was like, oh, I'm working. I just want to give you 10 minutes. And he's like, wow, I can't believe you're doing this. Like, I can't believe you're giving me a time limit. And I was like, oh my God. No problem. We're not compatible. Thank you. Thanks. That's it. We're not compatible. I'm not saying it because I'm pushing you away. I'm saying it because I have a limited amount of time. Anyways. Okay. Last part, I think. Is this the last? Yeah, this is the last part. Okay. 256. Page 256. Um, Good sex starts with you. I really, what I really took from this. Um, Here, let me read it. Good sex starts with you. We mean this quite literally. When Masters and Johnson began their research into sexual functioning in the late 1950s, they wanted to start by learning about good sex before researching sexual dysfunction. So they started by selecting 382 men and 312 women, including 276 heterosexual couples, all of whom had satisfactory sex lives. One surprising fact they uncovered was was that virtually all these sexually satisfied people masturbated. Regardless of whether or not they were also having partnered sex. I love this so much. Good sex starts with you knowing your body, knowing yourself, and knowing your needs. I'm a big fan of masturbation. I've been doing it since I was nine. I think it's great. I think it's a great pastime. I think porn is great. I think anything you do to figure out your own body is wonderful. I love, and I used to review sex toys for Adam and Eve. I love adult shops. I love everything around knowing your body. It's for you, though. It's not for other people until it is. So at first, you really should do it for you, your relationship with your body, how you feel about yourself. And then it's a great communication tool for your partners. Oh, babe, I like to be touched like this. Ooh, honey, two inches down. Ooh, a little bit over here. Ooh, do this. Like you can communicate to your partners what you like. So many of my female friends, so many of them are common, normal, whatever, and they'll have these normal relationships with their boyfriends and their boyfriends n- won't know why that the girls don't feel comfortable exploring sexually. And I'm like, bro, do you let her masturbate? And he's like, what do you mean? I sent my homie a vibrator one time, one of my girlfriends. I sent her a vibrator because her and her guy were in a long distance relationship and he got so jealous of the vibrator, he made her keep it at his place, which defeated the whole purpose. I was trying to help a boy out. So he comes to me and goes, hey, she's like not exploring. And I go, okay. So I got her a vibrator so she could figure out her body. And then when they were together again, she would know how to explore with him. But he got so jealous of the vibrator, jealousy, toxic jealousy here, so jealous of the vibrator that he didn't let her keep it. So she never learned. So they never figured it out. People don't know what they want. People will say, I want a girl who knows her body and is sexually interested in me, but then get threatened by a dildo or or, or a vibrator or porn. It's like, guys, you have to let your partners figure out their bodies, especially in a world where that's not exactly, or at least it wasn't encouraged when I was young, right? Like masturbation was a sin in my bubble. And then in her bubble, it was just like super private and like something she felt weird doing versus me. Like, I'm not going to lie, girls. I was so sexually charged as a child that I was like, oh, I'm definitely not going to be Catholic. Like I knew even though I struggled until I was 19 to really leave the religion. Because until 19, I really believed in God. And I was really struggling, but I knew I was probably always going to leave it. It's like, okay, I know I'm going to leave it. I just, I got to get there emotionally. And masturbation was definitely one of the perks. Like sex was definitely one of the perks of leaving religion. And I had sex at 22 outside of my mom and dad's house when I had already moved out. I have no sexual guilt, no sexual issues, no sexual, like I ain't afraid to be sexual. That's why I don't mind being on OnlyFans. What's, What's there to be ashamed about? I'm a body. I'm a human. 
This is what it looks like naked or clothed. What does it matter? Like I can't even fathom that it would matter, right? But to other people, it matters a lot. Just like eating pork matters to some people, well, to other people it doesn't, right? Whatever belief you hold will dictate your life. I love this book. I love this book so much. It's so good. And it's so basically easy to read. It's not hard. It's categorized perfectly. It's like really formatted beautifully. It's such a good book. You don't have to love every part of it. Just take what you can from it. If you find yourself hitting a wall and not knowing why you're not exploring life to the fullest, read a book. I promise you it's the greatest tool. Read a book. I'm going to read these 30 books in the next three months. Okay. So it's like 10 books a month, okay, people? And I've already knocked this one out in three days. It took me three days, 100 pages a day, and I knocked it out, okay? So that's what I've been doing. I'm doing 100 pages a day until I read all of my books. Um, next on my book list, I have volume two of Berserk. So I'm gonna start that today. And I'm gonna, I actually think I can get that that done. I think I get that done in a day or like a, you know, a good 10 hour block. If I have a good like 10 or 15 hours, I think I could read it easily. I'm, I'm guesstimating because I, I get distracted. And then I don't know what I'm going to read next, actually. There's too many options. Maybe a said guru book because I want to do a video on him. I'm so excited. Either way, books are portals into bubbles. They are opportunities to learn more about yourself in the world, right? I'm dropping these books. Okay, that's what everything is in life. So look, be open, be curious, be adventurous, do things, be sloppy, be organized. But through this whole process, get to know yourself. Because ultimately, this is about you. Harm reduce. If you want to be a good person who causes less people harm, consider those people. Don't just think about yourself and your needs. Think about what they need and listen to them when they say it. Right? Again, you do you. Figure it out as you go. Good luck. I'm sure you'll do fine. If you guys have any comments or questions, leave them down in the sections below. Please join our memberships on YouTube. It helps fund the channel. And please join our Discord if you want to do call-ins on Mondays. I'm also going to try to figure out the tech this week for getting memberships also accessible to the Discord. I want to hear from you. If you have stories, if you have questions, if you have comments, like the call-in shows are the place to be. I really appreciate everyone who participated last week. It went really well. All right. With that said, I'll talk to you guys soon. Bye. Bye. My head in real life while I'm dead My belly's being fed and I'm okay I'm just fine, yet all I do is whine Not to you in my mind, cause I know I don't make sense I've been nothing but blessed So why's my life a mess? Please tell me, cause I'm sick of thinking Yeah Sick of reaching out for the truth And living life as a fool Dun, 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 dun.